Hello. This is a number theory video on multiplicative functions. We have three multiplicative functions, phi, tau, and sigma. Here in chapter four, they talk about what we mean by a multiplicative function. Over here in section 4.1, Definition 19 says, an arithmetic function, well, first of all, what's an arithmetic function? An arithmetic function is a function whose domain is the set of positive integers, the natural numbers. So your inputs are numbers like one, two, three, four, five, no, no fractions, no negatives. Okay, what does it mean for one of these to be multiplicative? An arithmetic function f is multiplicative if f of the product a, b is equal to the product f of a times f of b. This is a lovely thing. It's kind of like a distributive property in a way. Um, for example, square root works this way. The square root of a, b equals the square root of a times the square root of b. However, uh, probably most functions do not act this way. Now, it is important that A and B here are relatively prime. Now, an arithmetic function is completely multiplicative if we can lift the restriction that A and B are relatively prime. This is not going to be an issue for us. We're always going to have a situation where the A and B are relatively prime. And it's going to turn out that all three of our functions, sigma, tau, and phi, are all multiplicative. So let's take a look at our handout. We've seen sigma of n earlier in the course. It's the sum of the divisors of n. And sigma of n does include n itself. Phi of n, we have also seen that in the course. It's the number of positive integers relatively prime to n. This was defined here the Euler phi function back on page 59. The Euler phi function of a positive integer n, denoted phi of n, counts the number of positive integers less than n that are relatively prime to n. And our third arithmetic function is tau of n, which is just the number of divisors of n which we have also calculated. I believe we even were counting divisors on exam one. We may not have called it tau of n uh, for exam one. Now, we have a handout that shows values of these functions. Let's take a look and take a look at some examples. So here is our table. Let me make this a little bigger. OK, you want to have these definitions in front of you. OK, let's take a look, for example, at 10 and the values of phi, tau, and sigma of 10. First of all, phi of 10. Phi of 10 would be the number of positive integers relatively prime to 10. You might see if you can list the numbers relatively prime to n. The numbers that are relatively prime to 10 are 1, 3, 7, and 9. There are four of those. So phi of 10 is 4. Tau of n is the number of divisors 
of 10. So the divisors are 1 and 10, 2 and 5. And we see that we have four of those. And sigma of n is the sum of the divisors. 1 plus 2 plus 5 plus 10 is 18. Sigma means sum. Now let's do some examples. Let's find sigma of 72. So let me get my pen here. Sigma of 72. We come down here to 72 and we come over here to sigma and we get 195. Now, this table only goes up to 100. So what are we going to do if we want to find one of these arithmetic function values greater than 100? We can use the multiplicative property. So our first example is going to be defined phi of 440. Okay, we want to find phi of 440. So what we're going to do is we're going to factor 440 into two numbers, A and B. But it's important that they're relatively prime and the two numbers have to be less than 100 because that's how far my table goes. So I'm going to do a prime factorization of 440. Good practice on that. Uh, well, there's a number of ways you could do this, I guess. Let's say 4 and 110. And this is 10 times 11. And here we have 2 times 2. And here we have 2 times 5. So we have here the prime factorization. 2 to the third times 5 times 11. So the nice thing about the prime factorization is we can divide this up into two numbers that are relatively prime. I could do 8 times 55, or I could do 88 times 5. It uh, doesn't really matter. That's the beauty of mathematics. It's going to work either way. I think I'll do 8 times 55. Since 8 and 55 are relatively prime, this is equal to phi of 8 times phi of 55. Since both these numbers are less than 100, I can look those up in my table. 4 times 40 is 16 with a 0. So phi of 440, I'm sorry, sigma. Now, oh, wait a second, I, I messed up here. Uh, I had intended for this first example to be phi. So let's change our sigmas to phi's and it'll be correct. So let me get my eraser here. Okay, now I have corrected this. My intention was to do phi. So phi of 8 is 4. Phi of 55 is 40. So therefore, phi of 440 is 160. We could calculate tau and sigma in a similar manner. In my second example, I would like to do tau of 117. Once again, 117 is bigger than 100. It's off my table. So I need to break this up into two numbers that are less than 100 that multiply together to get 117 that are relatively prime. So we need to have our divisibility test, which we learned earlier in the course. There is no even number that goes into this, but three does go into this, because if I add up the digits here, seven, one, and one is nine. 
three goes into nine, also nine goes into it. In fact, 117 divided by nine is 13. So this is nine times 13. So now, since nine and 13 are relatively prime, I can take tau of nine times tau of 13. And I'm going to look those up in the table. Tau of nine from the table is three. And tau of 13 is two. Tau of a prime number is always two because there's only two divisors. So tau of 117 is six. Now you might be saying to yourself, I think I already knew that. Tau of three squared times 13 to the first power, what we did prior to exam one was we take the exponents and add one, and we get three times two, which is six. There are six divisors of 117. So we have done our first objective. Now I'd like to look at theorem 37 and 39 in our textbook. Well, first of all, theorem 36 is kind of an obvious statement if you think about it. If we have a prime number, phi of the prime number is p minus 1, because the numbers 1 through p minus 1 are all relatively prime to p. But what about a power of p? p to the m power. Theorem 37, if p is a prime and m is a positive integer, then phi of p to the m is equal to p to the m minus p to the m minus 1. This is actually a very nice little proof, but let's think about what it means first. Here's the statement I'm trying to prove. If p is a prime number and we have a positive exponent, phi of p to the m is equal to p to the m minus p to the m minus 1. Let's do the proof. OK, let's write down what we're trying to do. We want to count the numbers less than p to the m that are relatively prime to p to the m. We want to count the numbers and they, they do have to be less than p to the m. that are relatively prime to p to the m. Now, if we look at the multiples of p, which are p, 2p, 3p, 4p, 5p, and so on, up through p to the m minus 1 times p, which is p to the m. All of these, all of these multiples, all share a factor with p to the m share a factor or divisor with p to the m. Obviously, they share a factor of p. These are not relatively prime.
to P to the M. The remainder, the remaining numbers are, this leaves P to the M minus P to the M minus one numbers that are relatively prime to P to the M. Therefore, phi of P to the M is equal to P to the M minus P to the M minus one. When you're writing the minus one, make sure you keep it up in the exponent. This proves our theorem. Let's take a look at a couple examples. Let's say we wanted phi of seven cubed. Well, seven cubed is off my chart and I cannot break it up into two relatively prime numbers, but I can use my theorem. 7 cubed minus 7 squared, I can run that into a calculator and I get 294. Phi of 2 to the 10th is 2 to the 10th minus 2 to the 9th, which is 512. Here is the statement that phi is multiplicative. And here is a very interesting theorem. If we have the prime factorization of a number, here is an explicit formula for calculating phi. You take the number n times one minus one over p1 times one minus one over p2 up through one minus one over p divided by s. So each of these quantities here is going to be a fraction. For example, maybe one minus one third would be two thirds. One minus one seventh would be six sevenths. Interesting. So we don't really even need our table because we can always get a prime factorization. And so we're going to be able to use theorem 39. Here is an example. Phi of 200, 200 is eight times 25. 200 times one minus one half times one minus one fifth. Now let's do phi of 1,323. I, I like doing these big numbers because it causes us to bring together things that we've previously learned in the course. The divisibility tests. We need to get a prime factorization of 1323. You might pause the video and see if you can do that. Well, first of all, if I add up the digits, it is divisible by three. So our divisibility test of three tells us this is divisible by three. So we have three times 441. Well, 441 is also divisible by three. So continuing with our factor tree, we have three times 147. One plus four plus seven is 12. So three goes into that again. So we have three times 49. And 49 is seven times seven. So this is phi of three to the third times seven squared. Now using our theorem, out front we have our full number times one minus one over the first prime factor 
times one minus one over the second prime factor. A little bit of simplifying here. One minus one third is two thirds. One minus one seventh is six sevenths. And now we're going to run this into a calculator. I think I'll use Desmos. You can use your graphing calculator and you get 756. This has been a video on introducing you to three multiplicative functions that we have in number theory, tau, sigma, and phi. We'll take a look now in the next video about how phi can be used in the Euler theorem. Have a great day.